Welcome to another video from ExplainingComputers.com. This time I'm going to build a custom PC keypad. I'm doing this so I can more easily enter some of the keystrokes I use in audio editing, although the keypad will be able to be programmed to use in any application. At the heart of our project will be this, a GL RA4 M1 very small and low cost microcontroller. So let's go and get started. Right, shall we take a look at the parts I've purchased for this project? And I've already mentioned the Xiao RA4 M1 microcontroller, which cost me six pounds from the Pi Hut here in the UK, although the list price from Seed Studio who make the board is $4.99. We've also got three Sanwa 30 mm snap-in arcade buttons in different colors just to be exciting, and these cost £2.25, which is about $2.85. Finally, I bought this 2 meter USB-C to USB-A cable for £4.50, or about $5.66, and we're also going to need these three 10K resistors and a little bit of connection wire. Here's lots of connection wire, we'll just need a tiny little bit, and I had this in stock. So, let's bring in Mr. Scissors and open everything up. There we are, and in effect, what we're going to do here is to take the microcontroller to plug it onto the USB-C end of the lead like that, and then we're going to wire up the buttons, which are flying all over the place, and also the resistors, and then upload some code to the microcontroller and plug the other end, the USB-A end of the lead, into a computer. It's also worth noting that the Xiao RA4M1 we have here is based on the same chip as this board here, an Arduino Uno R4, as I previously looked at on the channel. So, everything in this project would work with an Arduino Uno R4, which has got more GPIO connectivity. But, I decided to use the Xiao RA4M1 as it's smaller at about a third of the price. So, I thought you might be interested in the specification of our Xiao RA4M1, and on the top we have its Renesas RA4M1 MCU, which has a 48 MHz ARM Cortex M4 core, 32 kilobytes of RAM, and 256 kilobytes of flash memory. Also on the top of the board is a USB Type-C socket that provides USB 2.0 connectivity. And one of the nice things about this board is that, just like an Arduino R4, we can very easily configure it to emulate a mouse or a keyboard. Also on the top of the board, we have boot and reset buttons, a power LED, user LED, and RGB LED, and along each side, seven header pads. These provide 5 volt, 3.3 volt, and ground rail connections, along with 11 GPIOs that offer digital and analog inputs and outputs, along with UART, I2C, and SBI functionality. If we use the magic of filmmaking to turn the board over, on the back there are then headers for eight more GPIOs, along with pads for hooking up a battery, power rail, and external boot or reset buttons. The whole thing is just 21 by 17.8 millimeters in size and is a great little board for our custom keypad project. Greetings, here I am back again, now on a Windows PC, where we're going to run up the Arduino Integrated Development Environment, or IDE. And as we can see, I've already got this installed for working with other hardware, as I've demonstrated in other videos. But if you do need to install it, it can be downloaded from a web page, as we can see here, and I'll provide a link in the video description. So let's run up the IDE, which is where we can write programs, or what Arduino calls sketches, for Arduino and compatible hardware. 
And the basic process is that we write or load in a sketch. Here is the default sketch it comes up with by default. And then we can verify it using the tick icon and upload it to a microcontroller board using the arrow icon. However, before we can do this, we need to install what's known as the board core for our particular microcontroller. To do this for Seed Studio hardware, we first need to go to File and Preferences, and then scroll down like this and add in an additional board manager URL. And we can find this on the web page over here, the Getting Started Guide for the Xiao RA4M1. And if we just scroll down here, as you will see somewhere down here, there it is, we have the required URL. I'll just take a copy of that, like that, take it back to the software, paste it in like that, okay. And it should now be possible to go across to the board manager over here, to search for RA4M1, there we go. And I can now click on install. And hopefully everything will work out. Windows wants to check it's okay, we'll say it is. And there we are, we've installed our board, we will close down the board manager. Next, I'm going to plug the board in. I've already got it connected at the USB-C end, so I'm going to connect it at the uh, computer end, the USB-A end, so I will do that. There we go. And as we can see, its LEDs have come to life. And what's going on here is a piece of sample code on the board, so all that's happening is it's got power from the PC, it's running the sample code, which as we can see has turned on all the LEDs, and in fact the RGB LED is changing colour. Isn't that exciting? Very exciting indeed. Anyway, we'll now go back to the IDE, where we will select the board, hopefully there it is, it's come up straight away. Sometimes it doesn't, this time it has, and we can also see now it is listed at the bottom of the screen, bottom right, to show we're writing code for this particular microcontroller. And just to check that everything is working okay, let's go to File and Examples and Basics and Blink. And this will bring up a piece of code which blinks an LED. It's picked up the board, that is fine. If we just scroll down, we'll see it's very simple code which basically sets up the internal LED as an output on the pin to which it's connected. And then it's going to have a little loop which turns it on and off once every second. And so ordinarily we would test the code by clicking on the uh, tick icon up here. In fact, let's do that so you can see exactly what the process normally is. What it's doing here is a test compiler of the code so we can see if there are any errors. And surprise, surprise, given this is a piece of uh, standard test code, there aren't. And so we'll now upload it to the board, which we do like that. It compiles again and it's uploading. Very exciting and hopefully Yes, just the user LED is now flashing on the board. And so clearly we are now running a new piece of code. Well, here I am back again. Our microcontroller is still flashing its LED, although I now want to test out whether we can use it to emulate a keyboard. And to that end, I've written this very simple sketch, which initially includes the keyboard library, and then sets up the keyboard and waits for 10 seconds. And the reason it waits for 10 seconds is because once this code is running on the GORA or M1, it's going to be sending keystrokes to the computer. And we want a way to get in and stop that, and one way to do it is to reset the board by pressing its reset button, which will give us 10 seconds to start doing something else. Anyway, after that delay, we then have our loop, which is going to press, as we can see, the capital K key. It seemed a nice key to select. It'll wait for a tenth of a second, release all keys on the keyboard so that other human input devices can function, wait for two seconds, and do it again. So, let's upload this code. I've already checked it, so I know it's OK. There it is, gone across, and... Uh, Compiling rather, it'll get there in a second. Come on, you can do it, and uh, it's done. And we now go across to Notepad, and hopefully, once our 10 seconds is up, 10 seconds from when the code hit the board, it started running. Yes, it's printed a K, another K. It's typing K, and then K, and another K. The excitement is K, uncontrollable. But to, to stop all this, if I just press the reset button on the board like that, 
That should have stopped it. It has stopped it. And I'm now going to bring up the Blink script, Blink sketch from earlier, upload that just to get something else on the microcontroller. And once that is there, hopefully fairly soon, there it is. It stopped typing K. We go back to Notepad. It stopped typing K. But we have proved the principle with this sketch of emulating a keyboard. Greetings. I've now wired everything up as you can see using a breadboard and to allow this to happen I first soldered the headers to each side of the RA4 M1. Right now the wires are only twisted onto the buttons as they'll need to be removed so we can put the buttons through holes in the final case and then we'll solder on the wires. But everything here is working and the basic circuit is what we can see here with digital output 7, 8 and 9 each connected to the ground rail via a 10k pull down resistor and then to a button which when pressed connects them to 5 volts. And in case you're new to all of this the pull down resistors are included so that our inputs are held at a low level rather than left floating when the button is not pressed. Talking of which, I've set this up so if I press a button, the internal LED will come on. So I press the blue button, LED comes on. Hopefully you can uh, just about see that. Same for the red button and also the green button. But more is happening than this. So let's go across to the code, which has previously starts out by including the keyboard library. And then it sets up the built-in LED as an output and also sets up digital pins 7, 8 and 9 as inputs. We then begin the keyboard as previously and we also still have our 10 second delay. Although this is less critical here because this code isn't constantly outputting keystrokes, it will be easier to get into things, but uh, it just gives me a bit of safety. If we move down we then have our loop which starts out by turning the built-in LED high, which here actually turns it off. High is off and low is on for our internal LED. And then after that, we have the first of three if statements, which says that if digital pin seven is high, we will turn on the built-in LED. We will write a capital A to the keyboard. We will delay for 400 milliseconds, 0.4 of a second, and then we'll release all keys. And I played around a bit with the right delay here. I started with a much, much lower value, but in practical use, you needed a bit of a delay and 400 milliseconds seems about right. Under this, we then got two more statements, very, very similar for the other buttons, for pins at eight and nine, which output a capital S and a space. And I can demonstrate this if we bring up notepad like that. And if I press, for example, the blue button, we get an A and the green button, we get an S. If we want a space, it's the red button and an A and a space and an S and an S and a space and an A. It's very exciting indeed. And if you're wondering why do I want buttons that output these particular keystrokes, it's because they're keystrokes I enter all of the time with my left hand when editing audio in Adobe Audition and whilst using a tablet stylus in my right hand. So let's get everything transferred from the breadboard and I'll show you what I mean. Right. I've now mounted all of the components onto a piece of circuit board and my plan was to use a small piece of strip board. But unfortunately, I couldn't find the piece of strip board I was going to use. And so I've had to revert to a very, very old piece of board that I got in a bag of oddments from Radio Shack over 40 years ago. And the layout of tracks on the base of this is not ideal for this project. And so what I've had to do is to mount the resistors under the microcontroller. And if we use a magic of filmmaking, we can see what I mean. They're hiding, well, as I said, under the microcontroller. Let's uh, put it back on the top. There we are. And if I give you a wider angle, you can see everything is soldered underneath. It is not the uh, best soldering in the world, but it's perfectly functional. I think I've given up on entering this into the prettiest circuit board competition. I think now that's just a pipe dream. But everything here is functional. The buttons are blue tacked to the desk. And if we bring up Notepad, I can show you it's working. I can press the green button. For an S like that, I can press the blue button for space and the red button for an A. Very exciting, all working. As we can see, I could play with this for hours. 
And I did say I'd show you how this works in Adobe Audition, so let's go across to a setup for that. Here we are in Adobe Audition 1.5, my favorite version, currently running on my laptop, so I'm not actually controlling it with a stylus and a tablet as I normally am, but uh, it shows you the principle, because if I press, for example, the green button, it brings up Amplify Fade. I use that all the time to, uh, well, amplify and uh, decrease the volume of things. If I press the red button, it brings up the Click Pop Eliminator, which is used a great deal. And if I press the blue button, AD comes on, hopefully you can, uh, it of course plays the timeline. When we go back here, we can uh, play here with digital output seven, eight, and stop as you normally would in most media applications. And so as we can see, functionally, everything is now complete. But what about a case? We did a case for our custom keypad project. And fortunately, I know somebody who can build us a custom case. Guess who it is? That's right, it's me over on my new Christopher Barnett Maker YouTube channel. Hello, Chris. Could you build us a case? Of course I could build us a case. Brilliant. Thanks very much. There we are. We will soon have a custom case for our exciting keypad project. And here we are. Other Chris has delivered a shiny white case. He's fitted the buttons. I wanted to do that. I would have put those in. Never mind. They're uh, there. And I can see it's going to work pretty well. Actually, the wrong hand, isn't it? It's going to be like that. And uh, Oh yes, this is going to work very nicely. You could have some kind of um, pad on top, couldn't you, to make it ergonomic for your hand. Anyway, for now, this is what we've got. This is the case. There was a base piece like this. We've still got the wire, and we've still got the microcontroller. And Chris has gone and taken these off the buttons, had to to get the buttons through the hole, of course. So what we need to do now is to turn this upside down. Very exciting inside here, all the uh, reinforced things like that. And we now need to reattach these wires to the buttons and then attach this wire, put it to this hole at the top, put on the base, and we will have a final custom PC keypad. So if we use the magic of filmmaking to get everything soldered up, there we go. One of the buttons is soldered in. All the buttons are soldered in. I've also secured in the uh, microcontroller of a circuit board. It's on a piece of blue tack, but I can assure you that's not going to go anywhere. So uh, there we are. We just now need to put on the base. Just drops in. It's a clever push fit, I think. And uh, it is a clever push fit. That works rather well, doesn't it? And uh, there we are, our final custom PC keypad. But of course, I'm sure you want to see it working once again. Functionality won't have changed since it was put in the case, but we might as well test it for a final time. And so let's go across to a setup for that. And here we are with our long-suffering notepad on the screen. And if I move my hand onto the keypad, A, 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 S, space, S, A, space, A, S, our keypad clearly works. So there we are. I've built a custom PC keypad. And if you want to see how I built the case, head on over to the Christopher Barnett YouTube channel. I also suspect this is going to be Mark 1. I, I could already imagine a Mark 2. For example, I might add a jack on the top and link it through to a foot switch to give me foot control of certain keys. I might add in, for example, a toggle switch so I could toggle the functionality of the buttons in different applications. And I've also now discovered you can get these buttons in 20 and 18 millimeter as well as 30 millimeter. So I might try different buttons and more buttons, all kinds of things. But uh, I'm pleased with the way this has gone so far. And I hope that this project has given you some useful ideas. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.